بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Good evening everyone and thank you very much for joining us and uh, my gratitude to the organizers for inviting me and uh, to actually have an opportunity to meet all these great people and uh, fellow speakers. Um, <clears throat> my talk tonight is uh, about a fellow North African. I'm from Libya and the neighboring Tunis. Um, there are little streets of uh, half sea era architecture, and there is a, a kind of a common history. Uh, for example, the Madrasa where I was teaching in Tripoli was built by the same person who built one of the main madrasas in Tunis, um, with which Bukhadun was associated. So um, us North Africans are, are very proud of Ibn Khaldun, and uh, we like to celebrate him. So to actually get a chance to speak about him together with Adam Smith is a, is a great joy. And it may seem uh, like a strange thing to be speaking about a 14th century Muslim scholar and a Scottish Enlightenment figure, but it, it's not as strange as it seems, and the connections are not as coincidental as uh, it seems. There were rivers of scholarship uh, from antiquity that went into the uh, medieval period and actually eventually made it into the early Enlightenment and then the Scottish Enlightenment and the European Enlightenment period and directly impacted uh, world history. So there are actually historical links uh, between, between Glasgow and, and Edinburgh and Andalusia and Muslim Sicily and, and the Italian uh, Renaissance. And these are real historical links. So, um, and this is something that's very important uh, to remember. Normally when people speak about Ibn Khaldun and Edith between 1332 and 1406, they usually focus on the rise and fall of economics and nations, and this was actually mentioned in the, uh, in the title by the organizers. And normally people speak about the dialectic between um, the hinterland and uh, civility or urban areas. I would like to call Badawa natality rather than Bedouinness. Uh, natality I borrow from Hannah Arndt uh, because it had a kind of a, a pristine basicness to, to it. Uh, and civility or Habara, which can also be called civilization. And normally people say that Ibn Khaldun has a the cyclical uh, theory of history of alternating between Badawa and Habara and that these uh, Bedouin-like uh, tribal hinterland dwellers come in and they establish a state and then they become urbanite and, and, and uh, civic and then they become very rich and decadent and then they start to be very affluent as, as uh, Lieblin would explain in, in his uh, amazing uh, book on, on affluence. And then uh, that, that decadence leads to the demise of civilization and then there's another cycle where another group, uh, less uh, civic, becomes urbanite and so on. Um, this has been repeated so many times that if you read any encyclopedia article on Ibn Khaldun, and I hope you do, if, you have, if you're not familiar with him, you will get this. I'm not going to focus on this so much. I will only focus on the, cli uh, on the climate bit, uh, given the, uh, given the uh, occasion that, that we have. Um, there are other people who work on anticipations. They point out how Ibn Khaldun anticipates Montesquieu. I'll, I'll say a bit about, about that. Gian Battista Vico, the great Italian thinker, Adam Smith, and even David, the economist uh, of Chicago. The uh, spirit of COP28, um, uh, which is uh, brilliantly and graciously hosted by the UAE, uh, UAE uh, and then as we celebrate the Union's 52nd uh, uh, anniversary and they congratulate our UAE uh, colleagues and, and residents, uh, I will focus on client. Uh, sorry, on uh, climate and on food security. This may sound very strange. Does Ibn Khaldun ever discuss climate? Um, and and uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't discuss global warming, but he does definitely discuss climate. And he does this in a chapter which is often um, skipped over, and they must admit that I've skipped over this chapter many, many times. I, as a Bedouin myself, I jump to the Bedouin and the uh, and the, and the urban dialectic and the tribal history and how to deal with tribal politics, and it's very useful. Ibn Khaldun's guidance on how to do tribal politics is very useful in Libya even today. So I usually skip this chapter. 
Why? Because it sounds so outdated. It, it's, a, it's a geography chapter. And, and the geography is so strange because it, it actually conceives of the world as limited to what we call the old, old world around the Mediterranean, a bit of Asia, um, and, and nothing else. The, the new world is not there. And everything south of the equator is not there either. So it sounds like a very limiting chapter. Why would you read about old geography? Um, as a matter of fact, the main book of Ibn Khaldun that, that is often discussed is called the Muqaddimah, which means the introduction, because it's an introduction to a vast universal history that is about six uh, volumes. But there's a Muqaddimah to the Muqaddimah. There's an introduction to the introduction. And the introduction to the introduction is a chapter on geography. And it's actually very interesting because he actually almost uh, verbatim bases it on Ali Idrisi's work on geography, which is in turn based on the very old um, book on geography by Ptolemy, uh, who, lived, who died in uh, 170 uh, of the Common Era. Ali Idrisi is a very interesting fellow. He is a scholar of aristocratic descent, comes from Andalusia, and he ended up working for the Christian king of Sicily, okay. Roger. And his book is called The Book of Roger, because Roger commissioned it. And he worked on it for 15 years. And as a result of this work of 15 years, they produced the best map that the world has seen up to that point. And it continued to be the most important map until uh, uh, 300 years later. He also produced the first globe, a silver globe, that, that, uh, that had this world map on it. So al Idris's geography book actually preserves the entire geographic tradition of not only the Greeks, but also the Muslims. And um, Ibn Khaldun mentions that, and Idris himself mentions all his predecessors. What about this geography chapter? What does it do? He makes the following points in this geography chapter. Ibn Khaldun actually makes these points. And they may sound familiar. They may sound like straight out of COP28 talks. He says that temperate climate is conducive to economic prosperity and civilization and development. He claims that intemperate hot climate is not conducive to economic prosperity and civilization and development. As a matter of fact, he says hot climate destroys civilization, actually precludes the rise of civilization. Okay? So he would echo exactly what you were saying, uh, Dr. He also says that climate impacts humans physically and culturally, that it actually transforms humans physically in their features and culturally, that it actually produces different cultures. So that in hotter climates, certain attitudes and certain activities and certain uh, intensities of living uh, are there, while in colder climates, um, it's a different set of cultural traits. Amazingly, he also says that food its quantity and its quality impact humans physically and culturally. And he points out how certain foods actually lead to more vigorous activity and how certain foods make you fat and lazy and how certain foods actually uh, increase your intelligence and certain other foods makes you, uh, make you quite, uh, let us not say, uh, un let's not say dumb, but unintelligent. So, uh, and he talks about being overweight. Uh, something that I, I was I felt was a was a personal uh, reference. Okay, so he also says that and this is very interesting. He says that we don't have to be stuck with the way we consume food. He says that food consumption is habitual, and that it's possible to transform our habits to change the way we eat so that we can produce better chances for civilization and for for prosperity. I think all of these points are quite modern. And it isn't just because I phrased them this way. They're actually there in the chapter. So is Ibn Khaldun talking about COP28? And is he really modern? And can he address the, the climate change uh, catastrophe that is, that is uh, approaching us? Or is there something really medieval about him? Well, he's not quite modern. He's not quite the same as what we are saying these days, in that all of what he's saying is, that, is, is about a static situation. When he refers to hot climates, he's referring to hot zones within a statically 
divided world. And in this, he follows the geographers of Greece and the geographers of Islam that follow them. And this comes from straight out of Ptolemy. And, it's, and, and Ptolemy is followed by all the Muslim geographers, um, ultimately with Idrisi, who was the most competent and thorough. And they basically divide the world into seven zones. The first zone begins at the equator, and the seventh zone is at the, at, at the North Pole. Okay? And they think that the, at the equator, things are so hot, no life can emerge. Okay? They obviously haven't been to the equator. I haven't seen... Uh, uh, you know, lush green like I, I, I did in Uganda for. I mean, it's very strange. But, but they actually believe that in the, at the equator, things are so hot, life doesn't emerge. Okay? And in the north, it's so cold, life doesn't emerge. So to prosper, you must be smack in the middle, in the most temperate region. So re zone four, that's where human civilization happens. And that's the zone where Babylonia and, and the Sumeria and the Egyptians and the and the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, various civilizations of the of the Near East, as well as China and India, all of this is in this the right zone. That's how they conceived of it. The hot zone is simply not conducive to, to civilization. So we see that this is very antiquated and indeed very static. However, interestingly. I'm sorry. Um, even, even when there was an attempt by Ibn Rushd or Ibn Rushd to update the geography, Ibn, Ibn Rushd actually said it makes no sense to have prosperity in the upper half of the globe and not in the lower half. Beyond the equator, Ibn Rushd said there must be a kind of a mirror image and there must be civilizations on the other side. And um, Ibn Khaldun dismisses this. Um, with another intricate argument, but he dismisses it. So even the attempt at updating the geography was not that successful. So I'm not saying that Ibn Khaldun is exactly up to date. However, um, Ibn Khaldun does correlate temperate weather with the rise of civilization. And he does understand that the systematic collapse of, of weather, that when you do have severe hot weather, that civilization cannot arise. He furthermore, uh, furthermore, he, he actually talks about food in quant qu quantity and quality, and it's very interesting passages that he discusses about food, the types of food. He has a kind of a typology of types of food and associated human activities. But is there nothing dynamic about Ibn Khaldun? I dare say that not exactly. Um, he does anticipate Montesquieu regarding the effect, effect of climate on human culture and civilization. And through Montesquieu, I think, influences Adam Smith, and we'll hear more about Adam, Adam Smith later, because uh, Montesquieu did influence the Scottish Enlightenment. But and he does, he does continue the Hippocratic tradition um, and, and, um, and the Greek tradition. But he does this in a very uh, interesting way. There are passages where he says that one of the key ways historians make mistakes is by not being conscious of change. And, and he says this in his introductory chapter. He says that there's always change change in the situation and change in the environment and that the world that we live in today is not the same as our predecessors lived in and the world that our future generations will live in will be still different and he says the historian must take this into consideration so even though he didn't specifically talk about climate change he was aware that conditions do change and one of the reasons he was aware of that is because there was an amazing, drastic, very sad, and tragic change in his lifetime. And that was the plague. Because, you know, people forget that North Africa was also hit by the plague, not just Europe. He actually lost his father and mother to the plague. And um, so he actually has an amazing passage, which I would like to conclude with, about what happened after the plague. Okay? And we can easily read this passage 
as what would happen to us after the systematic collapse that, that uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Um, let us see what he says. This is about the environmental change and that, and that we must take change into consideration. It's a very important passage in the beginning of Ibn Fatima. And he's also aware of what happened to the when, when you have a massive depopulation or collapse. This is the passage. I would like you to, to read it carefully. He says, this was the situation until the middle of the 8th, meaning 14th century. Civilization both in the East and the West was visited by a destructive plague, which devastated nations and caused population to vanish. We can actually reread re this. Civilization both in the East and West was visited by a destructive climate change, a global warming, which devastated nations and caused populations to vanish. It swallowed up many of the good things of civilization and wiped them out. It overtook the dynasties at the time of their senility when they had reached the limit of their duration. It lessened their power and curtailed their influence. It weakened their authority. So governance basically collapses. Their situation approached the point of annihilation and dissolution. Civilization decreased with the decrease of mankind. So you have a depopulation of the globe. Cities and buildings were laid waste. Roads and waste signs were obliterated. Settlements and mansions became empty. Dynasties and tribes grew weak. The entire inhabited world changed. The East, it seems, was similarly visited, though in accordance with the proportion to the East's more affluent civilization. It was as if the voice of existence in the world had called out for oblivion and restriction. And the world had responded to its call. God inherits the earth, and whomever is upon it. Now, I come from Libya, and I spent a, um, a period of time in Derna dealing with the afterwards of the catastrophe of the dam collapse in, in Derna, which was caused by climate change, because the rainfall of a whole year fell on the Green Mountain in East Libya in a, in a single uh, uh, day, okay, night. It was, it was just amazing. Okay? 20,000 people perished. The entire downtown of Denna was swept into the sea. God bless their, their souls and, and uh, may they rest in peace. Okay? This is quite real. And what he witnessed with the plague could easily happen to us. And this is, this is it shows you that Ibn Khaldun is relevant. Okay? He actually goes on to say, in the same passage, when there is a general change of conditions, and he's generalizing now, it's not just about the blame. When there is a general change of conditions, it is as if the entire creation had changed and the whole world been altered, as if it were a new and repeated creation, a world brought into existence anew. Therefore, there is need at this time that someone should systematically set down the situation of the world among all regions and races, as well as the customs and sectarian beliefs that have changed for their adherence, doing for this age what Al Mas'udi did for his. Al Mas'udi was this great geographer, traveler, historian who wrote an amazing book. This should be a mode for future historians to follow, including the attendees of, of this um, uh, esteemed gathering. So, Ibn Khaldun is relevant. He was aware of the importance of climate, he was aware of the importance of the air we breathe. He was aware of the importance of food. And this he was not so inventive, but further developed what he inherited from the Greeks and other uh, Muslim scholars before him. The uh, work of uh, Hippocrates, the, the doctor, the physician, uh, on airs, waters, and places. It's an amazing early work that actually talks about the climate and its impact obviously influenced Ibn Khaldun. The geography of Ptolemy and Idrisi influenced him. The historian Al Mas'udi influenced him. But he developed all this in a brilliant way and in a comprehensive and systematic book, which I hope after this talk you will look up tonight. And uh, it's available digitally. You can also buy a, a, an abridged uh, copy from um, any bookshop or from Amazon. He's 
definitely an important scholar to read, and he was a, 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 a an early um, visionary of what Montesquieu would later on and what Adam Smith would, would later on uh, say in, in Glasgow and not in Edinburgh. And, um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention.